Good morning. Welcome to worship at Middlesbrough's First Baptist Church. It is good to see you here today in this place. We're glad we're here to worship together today. A few things you'll want to remember as we begin a new week together as a community of faith. Uh, First of all, this evening, a couple of things that are going on. First of all, we're having a new program for our youth. It's called Recharge. Um, It's at a new time at 530. We're doing some different things this year. So all the youth are invited to be here in the church parking lot at 530 for that event. And we are opening this up to sixth graders as well. So sixth graders through 12th graders here at 530 for our first uh, night of Recharge. Uh, You'll also want to remember that tonight at 6 is the hymn sing, and that will be down in the chapel, and we have numerous hymns that y'all have requested that we'll be singing together. What a wonderful time to celebrate uh, the hymns that we remember, that we connect with our faith. I hope you'll be here for that time at 6 o'clock. Deacons, remember that you'll be staying at 7 o'clock for our meeting tonight, Uh, so please do not forget that and be there at 7 o'clock. On Wednesday, regular activities, except for the fact that we have our business meeting, and we're also going to have committee meetings for all the new committees following the business meeting. Your committee may arrange to do this at a different time, but we're trying to give you a time and a space to go ahead and meet and begin the new committee year together. And we will be doing that on a rotation schedule, so if you're on two or three different committees, you will have time to meet with uh, both of the committees as best you can. Uh, So keep that in mind for Wednesday night, business meeting followed by committee meetings um, after that. If you do want to eat dinner on Wednesday, please be sure to use your bulletin tab to sign up or call the church office by Monday. We appreciate that. Next thing is fall retreat for youth is on Friday and Saturday of this coming week. It's already time for our annual fall retreat, and we're inviting all youth to be a part of that. And I also want to briefly mention that next Sunday night starts discipleship for adults. And there are some brochures um, in the lobby and over here at the exit about the, what discipleship will be about this fall. So I hope you'll check out um, that. And now I want you to stand and greet those around you. Come to hear the word, come to do the word, come to experience comfort, come to experience challenge, come to find cost, come to find joy, come to find humanity, come to find community, come to find church, come to find God. Let's worship together. Our hymn of praise, number 282, as we stand together and sing.
God of grace and God of glory, we come in these moments of worship carrying with us a load from a long week. We come carrying the joys and excitements, the pleasures of things gone right, but we also carry burdens of grief and disappointment, failure and exhaustion. God, we come with arms full of responsibilities to get done. We come with bags packed with hurts and hardships. God, we come bringing all of who we are and all of what we've experienced along the way. God, we ask that in these moments you would revive us, that you would make us new, that you'd make us more whole. Enable us to lay down what we no longer need to carry and strengthen us as we walk forward, unhindered by the weight of what we still must carry. God, we offer to you these moments of worship. May the words on our lips and the feelings that stir in our hearts be pleasing to you, O God. And may what we experience here in this place give our lives new energy for the road ahead. We pray these things in the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. Our Old Testament reading this morning come from, comes from Proverbs 22. We're reading verses 1 and 2, 8 and 9, and 22 and 23. A good name is to be chosen rather than great riches, and favor is better than silver or gold. The rich and the poor have this in common. The Lord is the maker of them all. Whoever sows injustice will reap calamity, and the rod of anger will, will fail. Those who are generous are blessed, for they share their bread with the poor. Do not rob the poor because they are poor, or crush the afflicted at the gate. For the Lord pleads their cause, and the despoils of life those who despoil them. May God add blessing to the reading, the hearing of these words this morning. Let us pray together. Eternal God, you are the Holy One who has created the heavens and stretched them out, who has spread out the earth and what comes from it. God, you are the Holy One who forms and fashions even us, the Holy One who has breathed life into dirt from the ground and who breathes life into us again and again. With your breath upon us and in us, you have given us the promise of redemption and the hope of restoration and the assurance of protection. God, we know this because we've passed through waters and you've been with us. We've walked through fire and you've walked with us. We've known dark and lonely days, but you've stayed with us. We've been broken and you've redeemed us. We've not always felt worthy of love, and you've loved us. We've been lost on our journey, and you've called us home by name. God, through all of our experiences down all our many roads, you have redeemed us and continue the work of salvation in us. Jesus was baptized, and so are we. And we need the newness of life that rebirth and baptism symbolize. We confess that we have many behaviors which, which look less than baptized. God, we confess the ways that we often measure our lives. We place an unbalanced importance on professional or academic success. We place importance on the money we have or the stuff that we want, the people we know, and the quality of life that we live. God, but you call us to be more interested in the content of our character rather than the contents of our wealth and success. In your eyes, we all have the same value. Help us to see with humility all that you have created, all people you have created. God, we confess the times that we hold on to old wrongs or the ways that we nurture discontent and hatred within us. We confess the situations that we make judgments about before we understand. God, help us to sow peace and justice in our hearts 
and in our lives and in our world. Help us to try new and more generous behaviors which are filled with love and goodwill. And help us to withhold our judgments until we truly understand. Be with us on this journey because our souls need the regular reworking and reforming that you offer to us. God, that we might experience redemption again here and now in this place, in our hearts with your peace and love. Expose us to the light of your truth. Soothe our restlessness. Draw us out, O God, and slow us down. Forgive our sins and restore our vision and send us on with new resolve as servants that our lives might be a servant song to you in all that we say and in all that we do and all the ways that we have opportunity to show and tell the good news of Christ. As we continue to journey, fill us this morning, fill our hearts with love, fill our ears with the words of your promise, Fill our eyes with excitement for new possibilities. Fill our mouths with words of grace and fill our lives with an active and abiding faith. We cannot be whole without you, O God, and so remind us of your love and grace and mercy for each one of us as we pray the words that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And it's not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I would invite you to open your hymnal to hymn number 287. If you'll watch the words as we sing them for you, it will mean a lot more to you. time all of our children are invited to the front for children's time. Well good morning. So the last couple weeks we've been talking about fruit. Anna do you remember what we talked about last week? We had what kind of fruit did we have? Bananas, that's right, and we talked about 
being good fruit and how God wants us to be good fruit. And how we do that? By loving and being kind and sharing with each other. We've been talking about the fruits of the Spirit. And the fruits of the Spirit are the gifts that God gives to us that God wants us to share with others. And so I brought my fruit bowl today. And over the next few weeks, we're going to be filling this fruit bowl with all of the fruits of the Spirit. But today I brought my pear. Can you see what the pear says? Love. Love. You see that? So we're talking about love today. And so I brought my pear, my love pear. And this will be one of the fruits of the Spirit that we're going to be filling our bowl with. It's just one of the gifts that God gives us that God wants us to share with other people. Think about this. Think about someone who loves you. Who might that be? Your mom. Very good. Yeah. Mom and dad. Mom and dad loves us. Now think about somebody you love. Grandparents. You love your grandparents. Those are all wonderful things. that you, Grandmother. Very good. And do you know that love is something that we do? It's an action. It's something that we show somebody. So what are some of the ways that you show love to your mom or your dad or your grandparents? Yeah, help them with different things, especially when they're sick. That's good. Respect them. That's very good. Do you know one of the very simple ways that we can show someone we love them is to give them a hug. Give them a hug. So we need to remember that love is an action. It's something that we do. And can remember that by, hope you'll go home today and give somebody that you love a hug today. And remember that one of the gifts God gives us is love, and God wants us to share that with other people. So today we have our love pair, and we'll have to wait to see what next week, what we're going to add to our fruit bowl. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the gift of love. Help us to share it with each other, even in the simple ways like giving a hug. Amen. Let's sing together our hymn of stewardship, number 488, Come All Christians Be Committed. We'll stand together.
pray together. Holy Lord, maker of us all, you call us to love our neighbors as ourselves, and you teach us that faith without works is dead. Open us to the opportunities for ministry that lie before us, where faith and words and the needs of our neighbors come together in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
For the second week now, the lectionary sends us into the book of James. Last week we read James chapter 1 and talked about right religion. Not just hearing the truth, although keeping quiet long enough to listen is not a bad idea. Not just hearing the truth but doing the truth, following through. The key verse last week from James 1.27, pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Today's reading is from James chapter 2, almost the same song, second verse. It's the same book, the second chapter. And listen to James as he continues to write to those earliest Christians about real live discipleship. James 2, 1 through 17. My brothers and sisters, do you with your acts of favoritism really believe in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ? For if a person with gold rings and in fine clothes comes into your assembly, and if a poor person in dirty clothes also comes in, and if you take notice of the one wearing the fine clothes and say, have a seat here please, while to the one who is poor you say stand there or sit at my feet have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts listen my beloved brothers and sisters has not God chosen the poor in the world to be rich in faith and to be heirs of the kingdom that he has promised to those who love him but you have dishonored the poor is it not the rich who oppress you? Is it not they who drag you into court? Is it not they who blaspheme the excellent name that was invoked over you, the name of Jesus? You do well if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are, committed, or and are convicted by the law as transgressors. And then skipping to verse 14. 
What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but do not have works? Can faith save you? If a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, keep warm, and eat your fill, and yet you do not supply their bodily needs, what is the good of that? So faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. May God bless the reading, the hearing, and the living of his word. In the Old Testament reading that Allison shared with us from Proverbs 22, we heard several Proverbs in a row, and they were selected by the lectionary, of course, because they deal with issues of wealth and justice, generosity toward the poor. So immediately we see the thematic connections between the Proverbs selection and James chapter 2. Each scripture in its own way calls us to do more than give lip service to caring for the poor, not to let us begin to think that they are not us or that they are the people with the problems. Proverbs explicitly reminds us, the rich and the poor have this in common. The Lord is the maker of us all. Now, the book of Proverbs is an Old Testament book of wisdom. Ancient Israel's accumulated observations about the best way to live in God's world. And many New Testament scholars would tell you that the book of James is a New Testament book of wisdom. A guide for those early Christians who were living as Christ in the world. So we're not surprised to find this morning the overlap of concerns between these two books. Both of them are asking the same essential question. What does it mean to live in this world with wisdom? That is, with an accurate awareness of what God wants from us. To be a good, true God person. Well, it means that our walk will match our talk. And in case you haven't noticed, that's hard to do sometimes. Consistency is difficult. Faithfulness to live God's will and way in the world can be very tough some days. We need wisdom. God's true wisdom, not the latest fad. The book of Proverbs gives us the distilled, boiled down wisdom of God. So often it comes to us in Proverbs in these little two-line sayings. But we have to know how to read these Proverbs If we read them like English poetry, we will expect them to rhyme with sounds. Mary had a little lamb, its fleece was white as snow. Everywhere that Mary went, the lamb was sure to go. Sorry to my fellow English majors, I can quote poetry better than that. But the point is to hear the rhyme, snow and go. That's not the way Hebrew poetry works. It doesn't rhyme the sounds at the end of the lines. It connects the thoughts from one line to the next. And when we turn to the book of Proverbs, we see these nice little two-liners. And some of you more social savvy people, I brought my new smartphone so I can punch it and see what time it is, 1141. Some of you more social savvy types We'll say, well, these are just little two-liners that are just as ephemeral as a tweet, and we can toss them. No, these are timeless truths. They're not throwaway lines or deletable hashtags. They're compact, yes, but they're powerful nuggets of Hebrew poetry 
that it may take minutes, hours, or years to appreciate their depth. Hebrew matches the lines in what is called parallelism. And just for a little lecture here that I do every spring in the Proverbs course, sometimes line one and line two are saying the same thing in different words, synonymous parallelism. That was the first proverb Allison read. A good name is to be chosen rather than great riches. And favor is better than silver or gold. Good name and favor, riches and silver and gold. They're synonymous. But sometimes the opposites are drawn out. Line one and line two are contrasting. Whoever sows injustice will reap calamity. Those who are generous are blessed, for they share their bread with the poor. You can sow injustice and reap calamity. You can share bread with the poor and experience all the blessings that come from that. Two contrasting antithetical ways to live. God's truth in the Proverbs is carried in the memory with these powerful parallelisms. And wisdom through history has often framed in terms of two alternatives that we might face. Jesus was using the Old Testament tactic of wisdom teaching when he concluded the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 7 showing that there were two gates and two ways and two fates that awaited the traveler. There was the broad way that leads to destruction, and many follow it. But there is the narrow way that leads to life, and far too few walk that path. There are two kinds of fruits because there are two kinds of trees. The sound tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears evil fruit. And then that, and that famous contrast, there are two kinds of builders that build two kinds of houses, and each reaches a contrasting end. The wise man builds his house on the rock, and it sustains the storms. The foolish man builds on the sand, and great is the fall of his house. Contrast, in order to help us see the wisdom truth in the balance, James, in the passage we read this morning, draws powerful contrast, too, to teach the Christian life. Why are you favoring some people and rejecting others? God loves and cares for everyone, especially the needy and the hurting. Your faith must be seen in your actions, James tells us all. Faith without works is empty, useless, dead. Doctrine is most visible in deeds. And your deeds would be more doable if you can see the plight of the poor, the widow, the orphan exactly the way God sees them and lets you serve them. On the internet this week, I found the commentary of Dan Clendenin on James. And he goes on in his commentary to tell the story of Will Campbell. So I conclude with Dan Clendenin's helpful insights. He quotes James chapter 2. My sisters and brothers, as believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, 
Don't show favoritism. When we play favorites, writes James, we discriminate and become judges. And when we judge, we've put ourselves into the place of God, which is idolatry. We judge and discriminate and play favorites for many reasons. Race, religion, gender, intelligence, politics, nationality. All those can come to mind as ways that we divide and discriminate. James uses the example of Christians who favor the rich and discriminate against the poor. Gary Wills puts it perfectly in his 2006 book, What Jesus Meant. God, in his lavish and indiscriminate love, never excludes people because they are unclean, unworthy, or disrespectable nor should we. No outcasts were cast out far enough in Jesus' world to make him shun them. No outcasts were cast out far enough in Jesus' world to make him shun them. Playing favorites is easy. Loving without discrimination is hard. Will Campbell discovered this truth the hard way. In his two memoirs entitled 40 Acres and a Goat and Brother to a Dragonfly, Will Campbell describes his own experience of learning to love without limits. Campbell was born and raised in the rural and very poor deep south of Amet, Mississippi. He was ordained at a local Baptist church when he was 17. In a delightfully improbable life, he ended up playing a central role in the civil rights movement. After serving in World War II, Campbell studied at Tulane, Wake Forest, and Yale. And after a short stint as a pastor in Louisiana, he served as the director of religious life at the University of Mississippi, Ole Miss. But he had to leave that job after two years on campus because his controversial views on race were attracting death threats. So then he did a stint with the National Council of Churches where he met most of the civil right leaders. In 1957, for example, he was one of four people who escorted those nine black students in the integration of Little Rock Central High School. And he was the only white person at the meeting when Martin Luther King Jr. formed the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. The hate mail from the white right poured in. And as he matured and grew older, Campbell had the uneasy feeling that he hated those redneck bigots who hated. He discovered how easy it was to play favorites and to oppress the oppressors. Strange, he thought, how much he enjoyed thinking that God hated all the same people that he hated. He realized that he had created God in his own image and after his own personal and political likeness. So through a series of encounters with some very unlikely teachers, Campbell came to admit that after 20 years in ministry, he had become little more than a doctrinaire social activist which is a very different thing than being a follower of Jesus. 
What was the key to his insight? He said, I came to understand the nature of tragedy. And anyone who understands the nature of tragedy can never take sides. Campbell saw how he had played favorites and taken sides. He had actually subverted the indiscriminate love of God for all people without condition, limit, or exceptions because he was just pursuing a ministry of liberal sophistication. So he changed to reflect God's love for everyone. He started sipping whiskey with members of the Ku Klux Klan. He did their funerals and their weddings. And he even befriended the Grand Dragon of North Carolina, J.R. Bob Jones. When the Klan members were sick, he emptied their bedpans. And then the hate mail came from the liberal left. He said in a 1976 interview, it's been a long time since I got a hate letter from the right. Now they all come from the left. Since God doesn't play favorites, Will Campbell concluded, neither should he. Tragedy teaches us that everybody hurts. And God loves everybody, especially the hurting. It's all through the New Testament, this principle, in the writings of Paul and the letter of James that we read this morning. But listen to the words of John. If anyone says, I love God, Yet hates his brother, he's a liar. For anyone who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And he has given us this command. Whoever loves God must also love his brother. That's what the Proverbs we read are getting at is what James says quite clearly. Why are you favoring some people and rejecting others? God loves and cares for everyone, especially the needy and the hurting. Your faith must be seen in your actions. Faith without works is empty, useless, dead. Doctrine is most visible in deeds. And our deeds will be more doable if we can see the plight of the poor, the widow, the orphan. Exactly the way God sees them. And then lets us serve them. The hymn of opportunity is 658, hymn number 658, Let Your Hearts Be Broken. Beth has chosen a wonderfully appropriate hymn. Listen to the words and make them your prayer as we sing together. If you're led to make a spiritual decision to follow Jesus or to follow him more closely to join this church, we invite you to do so as we stand and sing hymn number 658.
Notice the special opportunities of the evening. Let us bow in prayer. Because we have so freely received, dear God, may we freely give with the grace, the heart, and the love of Jesus Christ our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. Thank you.